Hey everyone, this is going to be a video on infection prevention and control in the older adult population. We're going to go over some of the basic risks and theory that you should know about this population and what you as a nurse can do to prevent and control infection with them. So first off, who are they? When doing research for this group, you'll quickly find that most of the research is based off of a westernized, white, middle to upper class population. So it's important to realize that, obviously, the older adult population is not only composed of white people, and that what we read may not paint a complete and or accurate picture of this population. So just keep that in mind when you're reading the research that it won't necessarily represent your client or patient. So let's start off with a few numbers and facts. One-third of all deaths in people 65 years and older are due to infections. However, when you look at people 65 years and older who live in long-term care facilities, that number jumps to 63% of all deaths. When we look at the causes of these infections, we can generally attribute them to any of the ideologies on this list. That being said, I want to specifically point out flu pneumonia and infectious diarrhea as being uniquely dangerous. So when it comes to pneumonia for older adults, a case will often be followed by death within one year after the illness. Of all the pneumonia infections that occur in a given year, 50% of them are in 65 years and older. You'll often find the flu to be a major risk factor for pneumonia, and because of these numbers, it's a very, very serious concern. Aside from hygiene, however, some of the best practices that you can encourage in your population and that you yourself can take uh, to prevent the, the flu from spreading is to be vaccinated against both the flu and pneumococcal infections. These two pathogens account for a substantial amount of community pneumonia infections, and vaccinating against them can go a long way. Moving on to infectious diarrhea, 51% of diarrheal deaths occur in people 74 years of age and older. Among the main culprits in long-term care facilities are C. difficile and neurovirus-mediated gastroenteritis. I'm not going to go in-depth into these two pathogens, but I recommend that you do a quick search and read up on these guys because that can abs these pathogens can absolutely devastate communities and hospital units. For example, in a recent outbreak case of C. difficile in a residential care home in the UK, five of six infected patients who came down with C. difficile died within one month of the infection. On investigation, it was found that the facility, like many healthcare institutions, revealed problems with hand hygiene and environmental cleaning. So, all of these causes are prevalent among older adults, but at least for now, I do want you to remember and follow up on flu pneumonia and infectious diarrhea. If you can only learn about two major infectious threats to the elderly, you'd be well served to learn about these two. Okay, so what are the factors that contribute to older adults being more susceptible to infection? Why are we so concerned that they will contract an infection? What makes them so different? So there are four broad characteristics that make them more susceptible or make them more likely to be exposed to infections. First off, we have communal residences. Being in a communal residence or long-term care facility will often mean that one, you'll have a large number of people on antibiotics, two, it will be crowded, and three, you'll be living with a diminished physiological reserve population. What this all means is that pathogens have a perfect environment <clears throat> excuse me, for A, developing resistance, B, easily spreading through a group, and C, invading immune systems that are weakened. Next, we have comorbidities. Most people over 65 years of age will have at least one comorbidity, such as hypertension, diabetes, COPD, uh, heart failure, to name a few. After 80 years of age, however, you'll often find that people will have at least two chronic conditions. These ongoing insults each have their own unique pathologies that we don't have time to go into, but they will, can and will, often result in a weakened or less effective immune system. 
In addition, some of these comorbidities may require indwelling devices, such as a urinary catheter, feeding tubes, intravascular catheters, all of which create additional portals or pathways for pathogens to enter the body. Okay, so next up we have immune system senescence. What this basically means is that because of the normal processes of aging, the immune system is both less productive and less responsive. It produces fewer immune cells, and the cells that it does have are less responsive to infection and vaccines. I won't go much further into this, except to be clear that they are both less productive and responsive. If you want to learn more, you're going to have to get a larger focus on immunology and aging. Last but not least, we have the physiological changes to the barriers of the body, namely the skin, lungs, and GI tract, each of which undergo a variety of changes that level of the tissues that make it easier for infectious pathogens to enter, proliferate, and bypass our immune defenses. So remember, communal living, comorbidities, immune system senescence, and physiological changes. These are the core characteristics that make the older population more vulnerable to infection. So after all that, you may be wondering with so many risks and vulnerabilities, what you can do. First and foremost, and I cannot emphasize this enough, practice good, safe, and professional hand hygiene. Follow the WHO guidelines for when to practice hand hygiene, namely before touching a patient or environment, after touching a patient or environment, before a, a clean procedure, and after a body fluid exposure. Unfortunately, many people and professionals do not regularly follow and adhere to these guidelines. So I've highlighted at least two for you to remember. Always clean before and after touching a patient or environment. I'll say it again. Always clean before and after touching a patient or environment. This is a component of the routine practices that are a part of every nurse's responsibility to manage and prevent infections. I'll be making a separate video on how to properly do hand hygiene and you can find it in the link below. You can also practice and educate your clients on prevention. Engaging in exercise, good nutrition, and immunizations can go a long way. Furthermore, when people are socially and productively engaged with life, they tend to have better health outcomes. So when you're assessing someone's health, you should also inquire about their social habits and hobbies, someone who spends no time with friends and has no regular activities that they enjoy doing will likely have additional concerns and require additional support in contrast to someone who does spend time with friends and who does engage in activities. Following up on that, you're inevitably going to be working with families of your patients. And though we do want our patients and families to be together, and though the family is one of the best social support units, there are often cases where a family will inadvertently bring infection with them on a visit to their older adult family member. Or the family members may be at risk for contracting something from your patient. As such, here are a few other actions you can take to work with families to ensure that their family members or the visitors do not contract an infection. So first off, recommend that they should not visit if they're not feeling well or are sick particularly if they have a fever, cold, cough, a sneeze, diarrhea, or vomiting. Show them how and when to wash their hands, particularly before and after going into the patient's room and also after they eat and or use the bathroom. Familiarize yourself with your own institution's policies and ensure the family understands and are aware of them. And lastly, familiarize yourself with your own particular client needs and necessary precautions if they are already infected. Do the families need to wear gowns? Do they need to wear gloves, masks? A lot of additional precautions can scare a lot of family members. And it's important to understand the rationale for why the precautions may be necessary so that you can work with families and ease their fears. Next up, we have assessment. If this is your first time practicing assessment, you may be a bit confused as to what is expected of you. When I say assessment, I'm referring to intentionally gathering data through a nursing perspective. 
You're collecting this data so you can analyze and reflect on it afterwards to gain insight into your patient's health. Effective assessment will, go, will also help you develop a care plan to move forward with. So for example, let's say I'm playing checkers with a new patient. He sits down in front of me and I can already number off a list of questions that I would want to have answered. Is he able to walk across the room unaided? How easily is he, can he pick up and move the checker pieces? What's his skin like? Is he able to focus on the game? Can he follow the rules? Or does his attention wander and does he make errors? What's his cognitive ability like? When I have a conversation with him, I'm also listening to his speech. Is he coughing? Is he short of breath? Does it take him time to speak a couple of sentences or does he have an extra breath to do so? Does he have to take an extra breath to do so? Your sense of smell is also a component that you can use in your intentional assessment. When, you, when I sit down with uh, my checkers player, how does he smell? Smell good? Bad? What's his hygiene like? Does it seem like he may have or have had some urinary or bowel incontinence? Does he always wear a cologne, but this time he suddenly stopped? Um, or has he suddenly started wearing cologne? Is he trying to mask a bad smell? Last but not least, you can also use your sense of touch to gather data. A simple helping hand on a shoulder, back, or elbow can inform you to their underlying muscle mass, how deeply they're breathing, and how intact their skin is. These are all to say that when you're interacting with your patients, take the normal conversations and engagements that you have with them and draw out the significant data about their health. Intentionally gather data through a nursing perspective. I should be clear here that for all the example questions I listed, you don't need to explicitly ask your patient. Ideally, these would be questions that you can answer within the space of a breath as you observe your patients. I'm not saying that every interaction uh, should or would be a cold opportunity for data collection. You should not be treating your patients like a science experiment. But what I am saying is that as you get to know them as a person, you should also be gathering data as the health professional that you are. Remember, it's, it's your role to be a healthcare expert. The better you can understand both the physical, psychological, and psychosocial aspects of your client, the better equipped you are to work with them. They and you are still people who are talking and interacting. You still should and will form a therapeutic relationship, but inclusive to that is the gathering of key clinical data that you can then use as a healthcare professional to contribute to a care plan. So after all that, what you can do is be the nurse that you will be proud to be. Be a healthcare expert with clinical expertise and hold in-depth knowledge of medicine, sociology, pharmacology, pathology, physiology, and psychology to only name a few. If you want to make a difference, if you want to be a nurse, then what you need to do is step up and commit to it. Wash your hands, learn about your population, learn about the infectious diseases that they are at risk for, and take pride in the expertise that you have and the care that you provide. Lastly, and I cannot stress this enough, so please pause if you weren't listening before and listen to what I'm about to say now. If you remember anything, remember this. The single most important action that you can take to prevent and manage infection in the older adult population is to speak up and work with your peers to create a culture that promotes infection prevention and control. Encourage your peers and colleagues to wash their hands. Praise each other when you get your seasonal vaccinations, and when you see that your clients are at risk for being infected, then advocate for them. Don't be silent, but rather speak up and have your colleagues hear you when you're trying to advocate for, for your patients. So let's review. Two-thirds of older adults in long-term care facilities will die from infection. Two of the most common sources of fatal infection are pneumonia and infectious diarrhea. For infectious diarrhea, two of the most common and dangerous pathogens are C. difficile and norovirus-mediated gastroenteritis. The features that make this population vulnerable are 1. that they will often live in communal residences, 2. that they will often have comorbidities that weaken their physiological ability to cope with acute insults, 3. Their immune system is both less productive and responsive. 
and four, they incur physiological changes of the skin, lungs, and GI tract that compromise the integrity of those barriers. Effective hand hygiene will dramatically decrease rates of infection transmission. Cleaning your hands before and after touching the patient or surrounding environment will also dramatically decrease rates of infection transmission. You should know the best ways to prevent infection with respect to lifestyle practices and changes. And you should intentionally assess your patients using all of your senses. And last but not least, you should promote a culture that uh, encourages infection prevention and control on your unit or on the, in the institution that you're working. So that's pretty much it. References can be found throughout the video and you can also find them here at the end. If you have any recommendations for improving this video or requests for future videos, please let me know and I'll try to make some more. Hope you're having a great day and cheers!